Okay, let's go ahead and get this show rolling. Welcome everybody. My name is Raul Carrillo and I'm the Deputy Director of the Law and Political Economy Project. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, we had hoped to gather in April 2020 for the LPE Democracy Beyond Neoliberalism Conference. While we were disappointed not to be able to come together in person, as a community, we are thrilled to be hosting our reconstructed virtual conference series thanks to the generosity, patience, and hard work of everyone involved in the broader LPE world. Today's event is also co-hosted by the Georgetown Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in the Americas. Our lineup of events and registration links, as well as a sneak peek at the rest, sneak peek at the upcoming blog symposia are available through our website, lpeproject.org, where you can also sign up for conference specific updates and reminders. Our next event, Power, Money and Markets will occur next week. Um, it is my pleasure, of course, to introduce our, uh, our moderator. But before I do that, I would like to thank Katie Super, Harvard Law School class of 2023 from the Harvard LPE chapter for live tweeting today's event from the LPE project account, which you can follow online. Now on to today's esteemed moderator panelists. David M. Trebek is Voss Baskin Professor of Law and Dean of International Studies Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Senior Research Fellow at the Harvard Law School. Dave, if you don't mind taking us away. Okay, so welcome to everybody. I see we have a very good turnout and I'm looking forward to this event. Um, as Raul explained, this started as a panel uh, and uh, uh, which was put together for the original conference. Uh, this is uh, a sort of um, a truncated version because of, of the limits of, of this media. We had a, a somewhat larger group. Um, so um, uh, I just wanna say a few words and then we're gonna turn it over to the speakers. Um, uh, our speakers today uh, and this order are Sonia Roland from uh, Northeastern Law School, uh, Alvaro Santos from Georgetown and Carola, uh, and uh, um, uh, Dan Danielson also from Northeastern and David Graywall from uh, uh, Berkeley and also one of the leaders of the, uh, of the LPE projects and one of the originators of the project. Um, so uh, just as a few words of introduction, um, so we're looking at what's happened to the post-Cold War economic order, which, um, uh, uh, which was constructed, let's say, starting in the 90s. Uh, it was based on the political economy of neoliberalism, and it had a legal order of which had two pillars, uh, the WTO and other forms of trade agreement and bilateral investment treaties. Um, this order facilitated growth, helped open up a large parts of the, of the economy that had not been part of the world economy uh, up till then. Uh, it it uh, benefited lots of people, brought people out of poverty in many parts of the world, China, of course, being the most dramatic case, um, but it caused a, a pain and losses uh, in many places at the same time. Um, in the very recent period, last say decade, uh, this order has been buffeted and disrupted by many forces. There's a global financial crisis that you all know about. There's populist reaction to the inequities that are partly related to this world economic order. There's been national resistance in different parts of the world to the global rules and procedures that were established. Uh, there's been great power rivalry, and of course the pandemic. Now, the Trump administration exploited some of these things, particularly the national of uh, the uh, populist reaction uh, and deviated from the rules and, and approaches uh, that had grown up there before. And they, and tried to upend the order. 
So you could say that there was a, a, another disruptive force uh, in the form of the Trump administration. So when the election occurred or shortly after the election occurred in the United States, uh, there were a lot of people were, were looking to restore the order, uh, thinking that we just flip a switch and we go back to the normal, whatever was the normal or they thought was the normal. This panel disagrees with that idea disagrees that you can go home again, as Thomas Wolfe said, uh, because uh, of the disruption, but also because there were, uh, there were lessons learned and the flaws of that order have been revealed in dramatic ways. So we have four speakers, all of whom are, have been given a lot of thought to where this world economic order is going, should go, will go. And I'm gonna just briefly introduce them. Uh, I'm not going to give any bio data because that's all on the website. You can just click on their names on the LPE website and it'll take you to full bio data. We don't have time for anything more. So the first speaker will be um, Sonia Roland from Northeastern followed by Alvaro Santos from Georgetown, followed by Dan Danielson also from Northeastern and then David Graywall from Berkeley. So Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, let me just share my screen so you can see the presentation. Right. Everybody can see the slides? Yep. Great, thank you. Right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which time zone you're uh, in. And thank you to the Law and Political Economy Project for hosting this event. Now, while most of the trade policy oxygen has been taken up by US-China trade wars, the rest of the world has been subtly but surely reframing international economic relations. And better yet, what many emerging countries are doing might actually help us forge a path forward in redesigning international economic law. So that's what I'll be talking about today. As Dave mentioned, the system for international trade and investment regulation that emerged in the 1990s basically enshrined two principles, protecting private investors from regulatory changes by host states and a trade liberalization process that focused on opening domestic markets to foreign producers. Now the cost and limitations of these approaches have become very apparent. Although trade and investment law were supposed to be somewhat neutral regarding domestic social policy choices, the reality is that the multilateral system increasingly constrained domestic, uh, domestic policy uh, space in ways that reflected neoliberal ideals. And this is very clear in the area of public health, access to medicine, environmental protection, the allocation of the tax burden even, and labor protection. States policy autonomy is also constrained de facto by disparities of bargaining power between themselves and global value chains organized by multinational companies. What is at stake here is really the adequacy of the legal and institutional framework that enables this market. Over the past decade, a growing number of developing countries have taken the full measure of constraints resulting from international economic law. China is dealing with economies worldwide, but is not buying into the capitalist liberal system. India, South Africa, and many other middle-income countries also seek to preserve the role of the state in orienting domestic economic forces and foreign investment flows. In short, emerging countries are no longer willing to trade policy autonomy for market access. Rather, they are seeking an international economic law system that supports the joint goals of market access and policy diversity. So how are they doing that? 
different ways. They're using the existing legal framework to their advantage, but they're also challenging it, sidestepping it, and creating alternatives to it. Let me present a few examples from the investment realm. First, some are move, voting with their feet. South Africa and Indonesia are letting bilateral investment treaties lapse or outright denouncing them. Instead, South Africa and others are relying on domestic regulation. Now that strategy has its limits because a number of provisions from these treaty will in fact survive the end of the treaty and continue to allow claims by investors long after the treaty has expired, sometimes as much as two decades. Another strategy is to revamp uh, model bilateral investment treaties that are used as negotiation draft to rebalance the rights and obligations of investors. India has gone through a redrafting exercise. Indonesia is also considering it. And the Pan-African Investment Code is another instance of such a redrafting. Those agreements have a number of features in common. They tend to redefine investor and investment more narrowly. They tend to limit investor protection. They create obligations on investors on corporate social responsibility, anti-bribery, regulatory compliance. And sometimes they also create obligations on home states to assist in policing their investors' activities abroad. With respect to host states where the investment is going, those new treaties or revised treaties tend to carve out more regulatory areas that would not be subject to international adjudication or maybe not even to the treaty disciplines at all. And finally, they tend to create a more stringent framework for investor state dispute settlement. Um, finally, Brazil in the perhaps most extreme example uh, or more striking example of uh, this redesign of international economic law has come up with an entirely different kind of agreement, the investment cooperation and facilitation agreements that are more of a hybrid between diplomatic processes and legal framework. We also have um, ALBA, the uh, Bolivarian Alliance uh, for the People of Our America that try to create a regional investment arbitration alternative to the World's Bank exit. And a number of these um, modifications or, or changes in the system actually coincide with some of what the old powers are doing. The EU push to create an international investment court, for example, is aligned with many of the concerns voiced by emerging countries with the current system. Similarly, in the trade uh, arena, we also see a variety of strategies. Emerging countries are using flexibilities at the WTO. They have built the legal capacity to deal with the rule-based system. There are winning cases in dispute settlement. They've successfully blocked efforts to impose new disciplines in negotiations. And then beyond these official flexibilities, they also create uh, what we can call de facto flexibilities and what lawyers would call breaches of the rules. And then it's a game of catch me if you can. Uh, because of the way this dispute settlement is set up. And we can think of big industrial support programs like Innovar Odo in Brazil as an example. Those programs do tend to be challenged, but by the time they're challenged, by the time adjudication comes to fruition and uh, retaliatory measures might be allowed, the programs might have largely run their course anyway. And that's pretty much what happened with the um, National Solar Mission Program in India, for instance. In addition, they are seeking alternative trade agreements and alternative trade partners outside of the multilateral system and outside of free trade agreements led by the old powers. The Asia Pacific region is perhaps the most prominent example with agreements such as the CPTPP, uh, the RCEP, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and then the many topical treaties under the ASEAN umbrella. Now, unfortunately, the content of a lot of these agreements replicates many of the issues with the WTO because they need to be WTO compliant. Uh, some might go a little further away from the WTO model, the RCEP, uh, for instance. Uh, and, and some, like the number of the ASEAN agreements, have also designed more progressive approaches to accommodate 
vastly different needs and particularly developmental needs of their members. And ironically, so that we're not just dissing the WTO here, uh, some of the more original approaches to trade regulation may actually have occurred within the WTO with the trade facilitation agreement. That agreement is radically different from anything the WTO has done so far. It creates a sliding scale for uh, commitments and it creates a fund for richer countries to essentially pay other members to implement more stringent obligations. It's been very quickly ratified by a wide range of countries. Uh, it's been a success uh, from that standpoint. And then finally, there are opportunities for legal innovation on subject matters where the WTO has left mostly an open field. Uh, think, for instance, of the digital economy, cryptocurrencies, and, and other topics. So to conclude, what does us, this all mean for international economic law more generally? As Dave mentioned, some think that the WTO type convergence model remains the gold standard. It simply needs to be reinforced. Maybe we need to increase flexibilities at the margin to handle some of the current functions, tensions. We doubt that either is likely or desirable. Rather, what we're seeing is strategic alignments on certain issues and a range of bargains struck in an increasingly transnational space rather than a purely public international law framework. And my fellow panelists will, will go much more into uh, those, some examples of those instances. Uh, the result is what we can call a pluralist legal system that stands in contrast to the centralization objective of the WTO and to the harmonization effect of traditional bilateral investment treaties. Now, such a pluralist system will only be legitimate if it places at its core equity, developmental and sustainability objectives rather than mere efficiency. And hopefully that's something we can work towards and certainly something that many developing countries are thinking about. And I will hand it over to Alvaro. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you to the LPE uh, project for hosting this uh, panel and to my panelists for uh, the discussions we've had and looking forward to, to our conversation. So my project is called the Redomestication of International Investment Law. And it, the question is, is the Calvo Doctrine making a comeback? Uh, and it follows nicely in some of the themes that Sonia has basically laid, laid down. Uh, this is a work that I'm doing in the context of the uh, center that I direct, Carola, the Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in the Americas at Georgetown, together with a group of students. Um, and, and the term redomestication, basically, we're using it to denote two uh, meanings. One is to bring to the domestic arena something that was international, and the second one is to, to domesticate, to tame or to discipline. And so in that sense is that we're thinking there is a redomestication of international investment law. And so what I'll do today is explore what are the movements that we're seeing that can point in that direction. Uh, perhaps one of the uh, central thesis of this project is that uh, even though there has been considerable criticism to the international investment uh, law regime from developing countries for a number of years, uh, certainly middle-income countries and, and uh, less developed countries, what we're seeing that I think it's to some extent more recent and also promising is the challenge coming from rich countries, from countries that had been big promoters of the international investment regime, including the United States and European countries, and that as they have become capital importing countries, they realize the constraints of the system and they don't seem to be so keen on, on how the regime works anymore. And so I think this is an opportunity for a pivot uh, going to the subheading of our panel, uh, disruption, democracy, and distribution. I think this is the time of disruption. There's no going back to the pre to the consensus of the post cold uh, war, post cold war. So, like the last thirty 
years or so of neoliberalism, but I think things are very much in flux. So there's a disruption, but whether the new regime would be democratic or more democracy enhancing and how distribution would work out, I think is very much up for grabs. Um, it's a, a little bit stunning that much of the discussion has to emphasize, as Sonia was highlighting a moment ago, the state's right to regulate. Uh, there is a, that has become sort of a rallying cry and the states have to kind of make that explicit international investment agreements. Uh, it tells you something about the uh, weakening of, uh, of the policy space or the reduction of the policy space of states. So here, what I want to just briefly mention is then uh, this idea of uh, the Calvo doctrine, uh, which is the creation of an Argentinian jurist called Carlos Calvo. And it basically, we can understand in the context of several doctrines created by Latin American jurists uh, trying to assert the sovereignty of their states to prevent non-intervention, whether military or diplomatic, often to, uh, um, to for reasons of, of sovereign debt. Uh, but here, the, the Calvo Doctrine was uh, one developed by Carlos Calvo to try to uh, establish a standard of treatment uh, that was national. So the, the easy way to understand this is it has a substantive aspect and a procedural aspect. So the idea here was uh, the standard of treatment of investors is going to be national law and it is the national law that's going to determine what that standard is uh, and on the procedural uh, aspect the idea was uh, the fora for litigating the disputes uh, between the state and the investors is, are, are the national courts uh, and so the international courts uh, have nothing to do with the way the state resolves the, the disputes I'm oversimplifying, but the, the idea was a modern legal doctrine uh, that was a nationalist doctrine trying to protect the state from military and diplomatic protection of the home states of the foreign investors. Uh, and what was really interesting is that this doctrine really caught up in Latin America. Many countries introduced it in their constitutions and their foreign investment laws. And it also spread out to other parts of the world. And we can see that in, in the non-aligned movement. So countries in Asia and Africa that basically incorporated this doctrine in their own uh, legislations. Um, and then what we see is an abandonment of that uh, doctrine and a move towards uh, signing and embracing international investment agreements that basically created ad hoc tribunals to resolve disputes with foreign investors. So that's a procedural part, but also a standard of treatment that was more favorable to foreign investors than to national investors. And what, what I see here is that there's now a pushback and we're beginning to see perhaps forms of redomestication, of abandoning the uh, international standard set by the investment treaties and also a preference to domestic courts. Uh, let me just show very briefly with you my screen because I wanted to just give you a sense of the magnitude uh, in Latin America. So this is uh, a story mostly of Latin America, but of course the changes are happening in the whole region, sorry, in the whole world. So there's um, different countries here uh, making changes. So forgive the Playmobil-like design of this, but here you can see the shift in Latin American countries. So beginning in the 90s, like a fever of signing bilateral investment treaties. You can see here uh, how many were being signed per year. Uh, and then the number of disputes that these gave rise to. So Latin America has about a third of all the world's disputes, 942 uh, in the world, 258 for Latin America. 
Um, I will go very quickly. Here you can see the distribution in the, in the region. Um, then states, because of uh, what they were seeing, began some of the states to terminate the, their international investment treaties, primarily Ecuador and Bolivia and uh, some uh, Argentina. Um, but here, so this, these are the number of disputes that have been adjudicated. Uh, the claims are up to 150 billion. This, are, this is what was claimed. Uh, and this is basically 51, almost 52% decided in favor of the investor and 46 uh, in favor of the state. Uh, the total awards amount to $29 billion. And you can see the distribution here. So Argentina is a country with more, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, more disputes followed by Venezuela. And this is, this is the order. And this is basically what they've amounted to. Uh, you know, Venezuela is the hardest hit, hit with 16 billion, Argentina, 9 billion. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to give you a sense of the magnitude. So this is producing uh, what we can think of as a serious reckoning with the system and in some ways, in some countries, at least a backlash. And what I want to do now is uh, just briefly talk about um, a map that can help us understand how this flux is uh, moving. So on the one hand, we have this uh, possibility of re-domestication, both procedurally and substantively. And as I mentioned, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela are all countries that have denounced their international investment treaties, um, changed their constitutions to, but as Sonia mentioned, uh, that it's not as easy as that. There are survival clauses that often remain uh, that make these countries still vulnerable to investor claims. We have a successful example of South Africa, which denounced its treaties and then passed a new investor uh, for an investment law, and uh, it's gone well for, for South Africa. The second possibility is uh, reconceptualization. And so here, it's not moving from the international to the domestic, but actually thinking anew what the purpose of the international investment system is. And so it's not about protecting investors, it's about promoting development and serving the goals of um, the state's uh, policies of development and of sustainability. And so here the idea is there's ways in which the international uh, order can help uh, create obligations for investors so that the, the investment is uh, positive for the state. There's possibilities for screening and seeing what the investor, what the consequences of the investment will be, but also bringing the communities that will be uh, directly affected by the investments. And so creating rights for these local communities, perhaps standing uh, against investors and definitely creating clear, effective obligations of investors uh, that have to do with the respect of human rights, labor rights, uh, the environment and so forth. Uh, what I think it's interesting about this, uh, this, uh, model is that it allows these other stakeholders and local communities to have a recourse against not only investors, but also perhaps against um, the, the doing or the workings of the state. It, let me just say this. Redomestication is perhaps, perhaps the most ambitious and uh, radical of the reforms, it, it really means dismantling or getting out of the system, but there's nothing that guarantees what the politics or the distribution of it will be within the state. The state also can show its ugly head. We've seen that with the developmental state. Uh, so the politics are quite indeterminate. Uh, I think we need to be conscious of that. And in this second mode of the reconceptualization of international investment law, 
it allows for uh, thinking about the state as an actor, but not devolving completely towards the state. And so I think that is a benefit. Uh, there are some proposals, uh, the Harrison Institute at Georgetown, the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment, uh, and, and Carola uh, has have proposed a, a framework convention for sustainable investment. But there are other examples of this. Um, and so again- Professor Santos, this is just a, um, a warning regarding your time. If you could wrap it up when you have a second, please. Thank you, yes. Uh, and, and the example that Sonia gave of Brazil, it's a very good uh, point here. And finally, just to conclude, the third mode of uh, change is reform. And here, this is basically what we're seeing mostly at UNCI trial, which is the, the reform of uh, abuses and malfunctions of the system, but without really challenging the assumptions of how it works. And so, uh, you know, one example of this is the uh, multilateral investment core proposed by the European Union, which of course will work probably better than what the current ISDS system uh, does. But I think it perpetuates several of the substantive problems that critics have pointed out. And I think we should also be wary of creating a multilateral core at the moment when we're seeing the pitfalls of the WTO appellate body system that judicialized politics and basically has also triggered a backlash. So I would love to say more about each of these different modes, uh, but this is a useful map to understand where countries are moving and what are the options of countries that are uh, unhappy with how the system is uh, working and how it's affecting them, uh, what they can do to try to change it. Uh, thanks. So, um, Dan? Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I know we're, we're, it's, it's, <laughs> we're all suffering from Zoom fatigue, so it's amazing to see so many people willing to join another uh, Zoom conversation, but uh, we hope to make it worth your while. Um, I am going to move a little bit in a different direction, different, different notion of disruption. Um, in terms of trying to think uh, maybe beyond the um, paradigms of traditional investment law or traditionally uh, international economic law and to mark and to bridge a little bit the notions of trade and trade and development um, more directly. So my remarks are sort of premised on three uh, key assumptions about the world economic order about which many of you might disagree, um, but I'm gonna give you a little sense of why I think um, they're important. And then um, based on those, I'm gonna suggest three areas that scholars, activists, and policymakers interested in trade and development uh, might devote productive attention in the service of facilitating and supporting more equitable, just, and democratic possibilities for uh, a large percentage of the the global uh, population, which is being left behind in the current system. So my first assumption relates to a uh, notion of disruption, but it, it's not the notion of disruption as a one-time thing. The idea is really um, taking uh, a little bit of a page from the period we've just been through, from the Trump administration, Brexit, US-China trade war, war in Syria, COVID pandemic, uh, extreme climate events, sea rise. What we're talking about here, I am presupposing, is that disruption uh, in, and rather than what we had come to assume was the relative ease of the movement of things, people, and money around the world will be the norm uh, moving forward uh, for the foreseeable future. So my, uh, the idea that we could have uh, relative confidence that a just-in-time supply contract is as good as ready inventory for a firm or is equivalent to a national reserve of PPE uh, uh, 
is uh, significantly shaken, I think. And as a result, leading firms are trying to think about reshoring, uh, also around uh, diversifying their supply uh, structures, building redundancies that may not necessarily be uh, efficiencies, but uh, nevertheless may produce stability in the face of disruption and risk. And um, nation states are also uh, considering whether you know, a national productive capacity to make things like PPE, for example, might be necessary for the public good, even at the apparent expense, at least under the neoliberal theoretical regime of uh, productive efficiency. So disruption is going to be the future, and we have to plan for it. Um, the second assumption builds a on um, Aaron Beninoff's uh, really interesting two-part essay in the New Left Review on automation and the future of work, as well as a lot of other scholars who are trying to think about um, what's going on in, uh, in the global economy uh, and how can we account for the percentage of the population that aren't in great, engaged in what we might understand as formal wage labor. Um, and so uh, what we're seeing, at least according to Beninoff, and it seems to me quite compelling, is anemic growth in the global north for quite a long time. Um, surplus manufacturing capacity, in part because of the success of integration of developing countries into the productive resource uh, manufacturing capacity of the global system. Um, and surplus labor. Um, and the result is, uh, is essentially as people are moving out of manufacturing and into other things, they tend to be moving into low scale, low wage uh, uh, service jobs, um, more precarious, less benefits, and also not bringing with them the potential uh, productivity gains that uh, the industrial revolution made possible so that um, we're seeing essentially no real bargaining power in terms of wages and wage, uh, voluntary wage suppression as a way of essentially getting um, a scarce job. So incredible competition amongst um, folks for a shrinking uh, pool of formal jobs. Um, the third assumption is, uh, is related to the reconstruction of the global system of production under neoliberal trade liberalization. And that is the increasing power, uh, which Sonia alluded to already, uh, in the global economic order of lead firms. Um, and the concomitant uh, diminishment of power of developing states as well as developing firms and workers to, uh, to resist the demands of uh, lead firms if they want access to global markets. So the supply chain structure has put lead firms in the position of gatekeepers uh, and um, made uh, developing country firms uh, in, put them in cutthroat competition fighting over uh, a shrinking pie, at least many developing countries. Okay, so, um, so what under these conditions might uh, we think of if we were trying to reimagine um, international economic law um, and international uh, economic relations. And so I have three kind of ideas or slogans. Obviously, um, policy proposals are always, uh, always risky, but these are not meant to be policy proposals as much as um, provocations for thought. So the first is, um, is to think about decentering trade law as the, uh, as, as a, as the um, uh, presumed site for uh, control over the global economic order. Um, in, a lot, in my own work, I've tried to show in a lot of different ways that uh, private ordering and, priv and private law are, are becoming increasingly significant, if not more significant, in um, what kinds of opportunities and possibilities developing countries and firms have in participating in the global economy. 
and um, and trade law made that possible, but trade law now isn't necessarily the mechanism through which exploitative power is being exercised. Um, the second, uh, so what do we do about that? Um, well, we need to think about uh, addressing corporate power and particularly lead firm power on a global scale. Um, and one possible mechanism might we might imagine oh, we would negotiate a global antitrust treaty or try to get uh, big states to coordinate around competition law, but that we haven't seen very much uh, success on that in the, in the past. And my sense is that the most promising prospects for that are going to be uh, using interdependencies uh, and new repurposing existing global institutions including things like global supply chains to, um, to provide platforms for new uh, redistributive policies. Um, and what I have in mind here would be things like um, uh, perhaps supplier capital and labor alliances uh, across um, competing uh, supplier um, countries for particular industries in supply chains to be able to to be able to uh, negotiate a labor floor, environmental autonomy, or other kinds of um, regulatory, quasi-regulatory power vis-a-vis -vis, um, lead firms, and thereby increase um, their, their distributional share of the power and of um, rents in the chains. So that's just one possible example. A second uh, idea would be, um, to decenter growth and long distance trade. So one, pre, uh, one assumption of the neoliberal order was that increasing international trade led to increased growth and increased uh, wealth, general welfare. Um, we've seen that happen in some places as, as David Trubeck suggested, but in a lot of places that hasn't happened. Uh, in fact, uh, things have stagnated or gotten worse or you see significant increases in trade volumes, but not in, uh, G in GDP uh, uh, as a source of trade. So, um, so what do we do here? And my sense is, and this is taking a little bit of a cue from the pandemic and the themes of disruption, including future climate disruption, is to think more about development, not as world competitive participation in the global economy, but rather as uh, developing mechanisms for an experimentation for sustainable local regional um, it, institutional forms for provisioning, support, uh, inclusion, participation, and social well being. So, essentially, um, trying to think about ways, in a sense, decentering growth and long distance trade and focusing instead on building the kind of interregional trade and interconnectedness that colonialism made very difficult for the developing world uh, anew. Um, and- Professor Danielson, this is just a two minute morning regarding your time. Thank you, I'm on the last point. Um, and I'm willing to talk about any and all of these things obviously more, I'm just throwing them out as suggestions for um, things that we might explore. Um, the final is, well, what kinds of trade and, uh, and investment mechanisms or, or institutions might we need um, if we were trying to facilitate this new notion of, uh, of regional development of a less interconnected world of a, we would need mechanisms and in, in, in essentially going back to John Jackson's old idea of you know, the trading system as an interface mechanism Essentially, we need interface and coordinating mechanisms uh, to, uh, to facilitate and enable experimentation. If, if places are going to de-link, they're also going to have to be able to participate in certain ways in the global economy. They're going to need to be able to obtain financing. They're going to need to be able to have autonomy um, to try uh, potentially uh, non-capitalist or other forms of um, provisioning and support, production and distribution. And in order to do that, there's gonna need to be a, a whole host of new uh, institutions 
that enable, um, uh, say, uh, a commenting experiment uh, that's happening in a particular city or region to interface in the ways that they need to with the global markets that may be operating under different assumptions or different, uh, different theoretical and economic um, rules. And so trying to think about how to enable both financing and, uh, and this is a different kind of policy space from state development policy space, but rather um, the policy space that would facilitate the possibility for uh, really new modes of, uh, of economic organization, economic, social, and political organization that are focused on well-being and, uh, and social support, that recognize care work as well as wage work, that the kinds of things that we might be all dreaming about um, are, are being tried in various places. But it's against all odds, and I think that the trading system, in some respects, is can be a hindrance. And so, one of the things would be to start to strategize how uh, international economic lawyers interested in justice might be trying to imagine the kinds of institutional order that would be necessary to facilitate this alternative vision of trade and development for the future. So I'll stop there. Great. Should I jump in? Yeah, jump, jump, okay. jump away. All right. Splendid. Thank you to uh, David for uh, organizing us and to my fellow panelists and to the LPE staff who made this possible. It's great as well to know that there are all sorts of people zooming out there. Thank you for being here as well. Um, so as David Trebek said at the beginning, I think all of us on the panel in different ways are seeing this moment as a moment in which what might be a much desired return to normal in other parts of the policy agenda um, isn't necessarily going to be a return to normal in the international economic law space, and nor should it be. Um, so there's a lot of uh, um, ambiguity about, my, what, about what might come. And within the Biden administration, there are voices that are on different sides of this. Some folks, I think, probably do want to return to something like normal. Um, but I think there's actually lots and lots of folks who realize that some kind of new regime is needed. Um, I know that, that the United States is not alone in that assessment. I've spoken to people in Canada and Europe who have very similar views, So, um, uh, and in India as well. And so everywhere, there's a kind of tumult. And uh, that's both exciting and uh, uh, and of course, something that uh, makes any kind of confident prediction about the future hard to uh, hard to um, to fathom. Let me try and suggest a few quick things about this moment. Um, the first, as I've said, is that there's a debate within the Biden administration everywhere about whether or not this blip, wh whether this this the Trump administration, but more broadly, whether the last five years is a blip in what should be seen as a uh, as the sort of logical progression, the march of reason in history um, onward and deeper to something like a global market regulated by neoliberal norms, or whether what we have seen in the various kinds of backlash is actually the culmination of those trends. Is, are we looking at, a, at an aberration or in some ways a culmination or an arrival? And I want to argue in my brief remarks here, and I'll keep it quite short, that I think it's, an, it's not an aberration. I think it's in some sense an arrival or a culmination of longstanding trends. I'm going to then second argue that this is tied to the globalization of neoliberalism itself, and that that form of globalization is what I call an impossible globalization. There are both possible and impossible forms of globalization, and an impossible form is one that proves unsustainable um, um, in, in, on any kind of medium to long run when, the fa when the, those things on which it's predicated actually get universalized. Uh, and then I'm going to finally spend most of my time suggesting the reason, or at least a reason, for which neoliberalism proves to be an impossible globalization. And I'm going to focus here on the dynamic of what's called increasing returns to scale. So it'll be very much a political economy sort of intervention in the tradition of LPE. But uh, I just want to note that to the extent you take problems like scale seriously, uh, 
the kind of reworking of global treaties that Sonia mentioned, the, um, the abundant and vigorous assertion of Calvo doctrine um, uh, that Alvaro mentioned, and the reworking of local linkages, different sorts of interfaces for experimentation that Dan mentioned. All of these are in some ways um, useful legal responses to a dynamic I'm gonna try and sketch. So, uh, so I'm, and I'm happy to talk more about all that in the Q and A, but I'll, I'll keep it short. So um, I think it's a culmination and I think it's a culmination of neoliberalism, uh, which to come back to the theme of this conference was democracy after neoliberalism. Um, and what neoliberal globalization tried to do was to in effect, uh, to effectively have the private ordering of the market substitute for the kinds of public choice making that democratic and non-democratic but public decision making had had done so that more and more areas of public life would be left to the logic of private orderings and in that sense the globalized neoliberalism is not different from neoliberalism domestically we know at one level that it's not possible to be a thoroughgoing neoliberal domestically because the background rule of law that the market requires isn't self-generating. And so there's always a puzzle with respect to the relation of private ordering to public power domestically. And we see the exact same puzzle internationally, which is why you have so much international legal infrastructure to make neoliberalism happen. It's the same thing that you see at home, which is that, you know, um, you need a lot of state to be able to withdraw the state. Um, now, the reason why this won't work th that I want to focus on is um, a little, it requires a, a very uh, a very brief uh, introduction for those that might not remember their Econ 101 about how production works at scale. So what's sometimes called increasing returns to scale or economies of scale is a production process in which the in which the marginal cost of each of each unit declines the uh, the more that you produce. So, unlike something in which um, production gets more costly when you in when you increase the volume of production, like um, uh, what would be an example there. Um, almost any task that you do at home, the more that you do, you know, the, the more you do it, the more tired you get and you stop being able to, you know, vacuum as well after you vacuum the 10th room or something like that. Um, in increasing returns to scale processes, think something like movies as an as a dramatic example. Once you've made Star Wars, uh, you can produce as many copies of Star Wars as you want. The marginal cost of each additional viewing of Star Wars is vanishingly small. So as Adam Smith noted as early as the Wealth of Nations, he said the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. So ultimately, and that was with respect to what he called commercial society, which he assumed was an increasing returns process. Ultimately, what that means is that the bigger the market, the more advanced your division of labor. Um, and, and another way of getting at that is that you can, you can produce at whatever scale the market allows you to sell at. All right, so this is gonna become relevant to globalization in ways that, that, that you'll soon see. I think neoliberal globalization by trying to stitch together all sorts of national and regional markets into a global market, effectively opened the door to scale dynamics, both within countries and uh, between countries. And increased returns to scale was a phenomenon that was widely appreciated in the 19th century. Um, in different ways, Marx and Mill both make it central to their critiques of political economy. And then it sort of disappears and it gets revived specifically in trade economics in the 70s, basically at the juncture where the United States is beginning to lose some, some increasing returns industries to East Asia. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the broad grappling with the dynamics of capitalism in a framework of scale um, hasn't sort of occupied the attention that I think it, it should. And this moment where neoliberalism seems to be in crisis is, is, a good, is a good one for revisiting it. So domestically and internationally, there are effects at both levels if the, the production um, technologies that you rely on have this, uh, exhibit this dynamic. Domestically, we should expect increasing levels of inequality of both wealth and incomes to the extent that uh, the productive technologies are gonna be um, are going to scale and they're going to become more and more 
concentrated in their ownership. There are some, I mean, that doesn't entail strict, that's not strictly entailed, but I can explain in the Q&A why it's likely. And to some extent, the sort of inequality that we've seen domestically that Piketty and others have, have diagnosed can be understand as um, relevant here exacerbated by the, the way in which capital you know, builds on itself, one way of getting at that is a scale dynamic. That has political ramifications, as I think David mentioned at the beginning, including the sort of crisis of democracy. Um, so I just wanna put a flag in the ground on the domestic effects of scale can be increasing concentration of capital ownership with the political consequences that follow. Internationally, I think um, what you'll have is inter-country inequality, um, sometimes superficially decreasing. So that would be the way that this is like compatible with the convergence thesis. But if you lift the lid on something like average country GDP, I think what you'll end up seeing is that places like Bangalore and Shenzhen are booming and the hinterlands are not. So the, you know, so so the inter-country comparison ends up becoming misleading when you got scale as as what's driving aggregate growth, which is going to be disguising uh, serious distributional um, um, complexities. But the, but uh, and this is also going to lead to inter-country competition over those sectors that have increasing returns, because to the extent that growth and employment outcomes are linked to control of those industries, what you see is what, what we've been seeing, which is increasing economic rivalry to figure out who controls key sectors, semiconductors, biotechnology in terms of the vanguard, but even things like steel uh, as the, as the so-called rear guard of the industrial economy. And this matters both for reasons of development and broadly speaking, global economic inequality. It also matters though, crucially for geopolitical competition, including military rivalry. Once we see that military rivalry concerns relative standing, not absolute advantage, right? One country's army is either big or small as a relative matter in relation to those of other countries. There's no absolute standard there. And you, and you put that fact into dialogue with an increasing returns to scale process, what you see is that um, countries can basically have their ordinal ranking in the, in the power game reversed by who controls the scale process. And I think that partly explains the US-China uh, rivalry um, and also in some ways Europe's desire to play a kind of third, uh, third wheel role uh, in that <clears throat> increasingly. Um, so I'm going to wrap up here, but I just wanted to note that the, the two things that we've seen happening in the neoliberal era of globalization, which is increasing domestic inequality, by the way, this is not only a rich, rich world phenomenon, this is also a middle income uh, phenomenon, increasing domestic inequalities of wealth and income, and internationally, not a move to convergence and global peace, as we were promised in the 90s, but actually increasing geopolitical rivalry. So that the Cold War partisans of the past are probably more at each other's throats now than at any point since the Berlin Wall fell. And that is not what we were promised a generation ago uh, when we were told that integration into the global economic order would be the solution to the vagaries of history. So where do we go from here? It's, it's definitely not clear, but I did want to just end on the note that it would have been no surprise to a 19th century critical observer of capitalism, like Marx or, or like any number of people, if you told them, well, we're going to we're going to get a global market, we're going to undergird it by all the best rules, all the smart people are going to be making sure it works well. And then suddenly we have burgeoning levels of domestic inequality and geopolitical, even military competition. The 19th century folks would have said, well, that's obvious. <laughs> So I don't. So what exactly changed between the, the the status quo default view that global capitalism would lead to inequality both within and between countries, and the post Cold War pan, uh, you know uh, utopia, is is an interesting intellectual historical question. But whatever went wrong then, I think our duty now is to try and get it right. So with that, um, I'll I'll shut up and I'm eager to discuss. Thank you all. Uh, this was great. And we have a couple of minutes in which the uh, uh, panelists can ask each other questions or, uh, uh, or make comments just very briefly so we can move to the Q&A. Uh, 
So if any of you have things you want to uh, pass on or questions you want to ask of each other, we've got about you know six or seven minutes for that or 10 minutes at the most. And if we don't, then we can move on. But if you'll- I, I do, I have two questions, uh, one for Dan and one for David. Uh, and, and so for Dan, uh, in, in the, in the really useful uh, scheme that you presented, you have uh, one of these, uh, the, the last of the possibilities, which was the interface mechanism, I think. No, sorry, the one on the center growth and long distance trade, basically the second uh, of your slogans. Uh, I, I think this, so you're talking about sustainable, local, regional, institutional forms, but also forms that were inclusive, that fomented participation and social well-being. And, and here what I see is an aspiration of these two things. Uh, one is material well-being in ways that directly benefit local communities, uh, away from the promise that somehow increasing trade will benefit, uh, you know, the, 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 the small businesses and the, you know, people, the ordinary you know, men and women who don't have access to the global market. And then uh, the idea of inclusion and democracy. And I, I don't see those two things necessarily going in tandem. I, I, I can see why it would be obviously uh, desirable, but it seems to me that this is, a, this is a tension that it's good to keep in mind because I don't see a, a direct relationship between these two things. And, and it relates to our theme of, disruption, democracy, and distribution. I think it, there will be redistribution or a reallocation uh, if this process goes on, but I'm not sure about the democratic aspect of it. And so I think it'd be helpful to think about, you know, or to know your thoughts. And, and uh, David, um, so let me see how, how I put this. I think we had a bit of a discussion on this last time around, but it's, uh, it's that I, I think I agree completely with your characterization of neoliberalism in the in the sense that it basically sits on the backbone of the state and, and so that's true domestically and also internationally. But you seem to suggest that the, this was inevitable, that in some ways, you know, the disruption and what we're seeing, the increasing rivalry between the powers and the the discontent because of inequality was gonna come was going to lead to the demise of the system. And, and there, I wonder if you think that either of these two sort of a phenomena is more important than the other, because international rivalry and competition obviously is not new and it's been there for forever. Is there something particular about this new rivalry that you think is really doing a checkmate on the system? Uh, or do you think it's more the upheaval domestically in rich countries or even middle-income countries because of the increase in inequality. And the reason I'm asking this is because your presentation reminded me of some of the um, some of the, the indictments by the uh, scholars advancing the new international economic order. So um, I remember Mohammed Benjawi, you know, and the idea that, you know, this system, it, it, you, you have to change the system and establish a new international economic order, not only because it's fair and will lead to better, uh, you know, distribution worldwide, but because Otherwise, you'll see your own demise. Basically, there'll be a revolution, and you know people will come after you. And so, it's on in your own self-interest. And I think that you know we're familiar with that trope, but it also okay. ignores. Short question. This, this okay, sorry, I'll, I'll finish here. It's just only have a couple of minutes here. It's very exciting. Uh, it ignores the work of ideology, repression, you know, false consciousness, and the ways in which. You know, people might favor things that are not in their material interests, and the state might be quite good at repressing people and so forth. So, anyway, you know, both really, all all of the presentations really interesting. I, I don't have much to ask Sonia because 
I agree with a lot of what Good, you good, because we've got to move on. Uh, so Dan and David, just very brief responses. We have quite a few questions and I don't want to cut the audience off. Uh, Absolutely. Um, so I completely agree with you, Alvaro. I think, I, think I think there's no guarantee that, uh, that trying to reimagine a system of provisioning, um, support, inclusion, participation would necessarily lead to democratic or non-exploitative structures of governance. It's entirely possible that you, you could do that with a mafia. I mean, you could do that anyway, right? So I mean, so part of, so I think there needs, that's partly why I was suggesting the third piece, which is we need the, 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 the new institutional forms partly have to emerge out of the experimentation because we need to see what kind of, how people are trying to design their social, political and economic life. Um, I do think if you reduce scarcity and vulnerability and fear, you might reduce, uh, you would, might reduce rivalry, it wouldn't necessarily reduce the motivation for exploitation and other, other things. Um, but I think those are, uh, those are important and key issues that need to be taken into account. And the reason that I was focusing on the third piece of, you know, interface mechanisms and so forth is because you know, we would, in a certain sense, be returning to something like the early uh, modern economy, where the local, you know, there was the local economy in long distance trade, and those things weren't necessarily deeply interconnected with each other. And if we, and if we imagine, either voluntarily or because of climate disruption or other things. The segmentation of the world in ways that we can't fully uh, accommodate with, then then we would need to have mechanisms for doing it, and we would need to have mechanisms for getting things that everyone needs but not everyone has, uh, globally distributed, and things that could be produced locally could be locally distributed. And you know, I mean, so there it become it, it requires a whole new set of institutions um, that might. The alternatives to the market, and uh, and that's that's the proposal, um, at least as a thought experiment. Okay, good. Thank very you, quickly, and David. Yeah, very quickly. I think what changed is that the Cold War was enormously convenient because uh, it mapped up uh, economic and political ideologies, so that so that the, the rivals didn't want to trade with each other, and so what we have in the post Cold War is the much more ambiguous situation, which is actually a reversion to the pre 20th century historical norm, where you have states that are simultaneously conducting war games against one another in one part of the government and, and trying to draft trade treaties with the other part of the government. And to my mind, this is a bit crazy. But uh, so, uh, so the, the rivalry with China, which takes place both in economic and political uh, grounds, for example, is much more complicated than with the Soviet Union, where in those days, every time you had a new trade treaty or a new overseas military base, it was a gain for the West and, and, and the Soviets didn't want to play in that game. So this is the more complicated world. Yes, it's a lot like the world of say the 17th century, but that was a world that was you know, much more, much less worrisomely uh, armed than this one. On the NIEO, what amazes me about that, even though I'm sort of ideologically you know, predisposed to like it is how quickly it folded. And how little, how little really came of that. So I, I actually think something like Calvo Doctrine, that's been an enduring tool that developing countries have turned to again and again in different ways. But an alliance to like reconstitute the global rules, it's it's it, it didn't happen for and understanding why is complicated. But I think part of the issue is NIEO to the extent that you know it was trying to rally primary agricultural producers around a different kind of market regime they were always operating behind the curve on the scale dynamics. Whereas as soon as China moved into industrialization, that has that is actually what sort of upended the existing game. Okay, well, um, I think we better turn to the questions and answers because we have quite a few. And I, um, I guess the way it works is I'm going to read uh, them and then the panelists will answer. Uh, 
Now here's one that is about 15 pages long. So let me see if I can summarize it. Uh, this is from Sanoi Das. Um, in uh, uh, to David and others in uh, rewriting international economic law, progressives usually look toward more policy space, more sovereign authority. If neoliberalism built its back on the bureaucratic architecture of social democratic states, why cannot subaltern cosmopolitanism or the workers international emerge on the back of a neoliberal global architecture. If, if neoliberalism was able to build itself on the back of social democratic states, why can't subaltern cosmopolitanism emerge on the back of a neoliberal global architecture? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's hear what uh, you have to say and we'll go in reverse order of the presentations. That's David, uh, uh, Dan, uh, Alvaro, Sonia. I'll just say briefly, democratic deficit. Um, social democracy had a conception of citizenship where everyone could actually uh, take part in making the social democracy and therefore the, the legal order that was gonna tame the market had legitimacy. And that problem has not yet been solved by various kinds of transnational or supranational um, configurations. And my own view is that it is unlikely to be. Okay. Dan? I think I, I would uh, respond somewhat differently. I, I think it could. I think that actually it's very unlikely that we're going to have the abolition of neoliberal uh, legal architecture or that it, if it were removed and even getting rid of investment treaties, you still have the long tail and you have the ideological tail and all the other things. I think that's not gonna happen. So what we're really talking about is repurposing and re and that reconstituting in existing institutions. And that was what I was trying not very articulately to, to suggest with respect to using say value chains where you have structures of interdependence. They are radically asymmetrically organized but they do produce, they do have an internal logic that, and a, and a distribution of power that isn't unlike the kind of uh, situation that workers were in when they invented collective bargaining. So the question would be then, how do you start to organize participants in the chain? Even participants that see themselves right now as rivals, to see themselves as a co, uh, co, uh, subordinated people uh, in, a, in, a, in an unfair system and then assert that power. And there have been examples of that in, um, in uh, various uh, social movements around it. workers in uh, platform firms, um, different kinds of folks have tried to use this I, and, and also worker organized social responsibility things like the Tamakli or Makli workers. Um, but I think that we really have to think about those possibilities and, and it would be crazy to not take into consideration the possibility of activating extant transnational institutional forms for new political purposes. And so, you know, I'm, the value chain is only one, but I, it wouldn't be the only thing to do, but I think we should certainly be thinking about it um, very soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Alvaro. Um, so for Sanoi's question, briefly, briefly. <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, I don't have a, you know, a very succinct answer, but I'll, I'll just say part of it might be, I agree with your diagnosis, which is that a lot of the progressive force focuses on re-empowering the state. And uh, there's a lot more to say about the, uh, as you call them, cosmopolitan subaltern. Uh, and that I think part of it might be that the, the social democracy in which the neoliberal uh, program rested had already a capitulation of a lot of the you know, communities, including workers, that were not really participating very actively in the, in the life of the, of the state and of economic policy. Uh, so uh, Roberto Unger, for example, criticizes social democracy for that very reason. Uh, I, compromise that didn't serve well. 
uh, for both well-being, but also for the work of reimagining the, the domestic institutions. And I think that part of what happens is that many of these communities might be still too hopeful of the work of the state. Uh, but I, but I, I think that this is a, an important challenge and perhaps where more work needs to be done, how to articulate or link uh, these communities that often have not done well with the strong state in when we rethink the international institutions of the economic order. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, uh, I feel like a, you know, there's a patient in a room full of doctors and they each have a different diagnosis of uh, what this patient is all about. Uh, so I'll be the fourth doctor there. Um, so I, th I think it's interesting. On the one hand, we have the, the resurgence, as Alvaro said, of the Calvo doctrine, and, and we can also think of the coming back into fashion of order liberalism. So various, various notions of re-empowering the state and rethinking the role of the state in managing the economy, right? As opposed to neoliberalism, which is all about taking the state out of the equation. At the same time, all of the, I would say, I don't want to say state-centered, but you know, pro-state theories have two issues, right? They, they have two fundamental problems there. First of all, they rely on the mediation of the state, you know, going back to the to the legitimacy democracy issue that David was mentioning. And we know that mediation doesn't work well, especially when the state is captured by special interests. Uh, and second, there's the assumption that the state will um, redistribute domestically pursuant to whatever social contract exists domestically. And now we also know that that doesn't quite work, right? That hasn't worked since World War II quite the way it was meant to, even in areas like Europe with um, a, a strong kind of sense of uh, social safety net and that the state will engage in this redistribution. To me, what that leads with that, with that, I guess, um, leads me to think about the international system is that this notion that redistribution is something for, to, to be happening domestically and that's not the purpose of international regulation is fundamentally flawed. Uh, and so we do have to grapple that at the international level. We do have to think, we cannot ignore the distributive consequences of international or transnational right, regulation. And, and starting from there is a key aspect. No. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna read another question. Um, hold on a second. Um, all right, to, to a question for Sonia, how would the new international economic law seek a principled approach for balancing diverse policy issues. Okay. Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, I, I, I would say, and I concur with the, what the, many of the fellow panelists here said, decentering growth and efficiency as the first and foremost goal to which all are second is the absolutely necessary first step, right? Um, we, in the trade field, we talk about non-trade questions. Well, these non-trade questions are the environment as our access to public health, the rights of workers. This is not non-trade, this is trade. And it, so, but so long as we continue to understand it as a non-trade issue, then we're never going to address it. Uh, so figuring out the, the, th that intersection, how trade has to look beyond economics in order to actually address the universe of trade impacts is necessary. Uh, and I would say, so in terms of the how concrete steps, um, and here I'll nod to a, a question that Peter Winship wrote in the chat as well regarding the future of uniform law produced by UNICETROL and the Hague Conference on Public and um, Private International Law. I think there's actually a big future for international economic law as private international law. What we're going to need is a system to deal with the conflicts, the overlaps and the gaps in jurisdiction and in regulation between different treaty systems, between public and private orderings. So I would say the future of international economic law is private international law. Okay, so um, now uh, I got a message from the organizers. 
suggesting that we could stay a little longer. We don't have to stop at exactly 5.30. And so I'm going to ask the panelists if they would agree to stay, say another 10 minutes to 5.40. Is that agreeable? Yes. Okay, all right, good. Because we have quite a few questions, uh, some of which uh, I'm having, you know, okay. I, I'm just going to uh, take this one. Uh, this is from Ianis. So to Professor Graywall primarily, but also to all. If the global turn to economies of scale is undergirded by national and international law, what could be the guiding vision of legal transformation for the global economy? Would degrowth feature somewhere in the answer? So this is directed to David, but then I'm going to ask him to answer um, because this issue of scale, I think, is extremely important. Uh, and we haven't mentioned uh, it in the digital economy, but it's just as important there. And uh, uh, so uh, David answers, and then anybody else who wants to can just weigh in. Very briefly, I'm, I'm struck when rereading the Havana Charter that didn't pass, right? The International Treaty Organization, uh, International Trade Organization, to, w from which basically we extracted chapter four on trade, and that became the provisional GATT in application, right? The old GATT. Um, by the way in which it seems to have had a scheme for dividing up production shares across members. And I wonder whether or not the mid-century Keynesians, and I suspect the mid-century Keynesians were much smarter than us, and they already worked out all these Keynesian, all these scale issues, and they worked out and they worked out the finance trade interlinkage. So they weren't thinking about trade as if it didn't scale, and they weren't thinking about trade as if it were barter. Whereas the way that we teach and learn about international economic law assumes trade is barter, i.e. finance doesn't matter, and assumes that scale doesn't matter which means you don't have to think hard about how you're gonna have competing possible equilibria that are of strategic relevance. If you put those things back into the equation, then I think we have to think down the road about allocating production shares across countries. Now that is gonna take a tremendous effort at constructing a legitimate regime where countries could actually go in for things like voluntary restraint agreements and have that be part of an ongoing dialogue. I don't see it happening with outside of a relatively small handful of countries that are allies. I, so there we are. And I think that the, the old GATT, it was an agreement among allies. They took the security question off the table and then they could be as bold as they were. To try and do it w across a geopolitical rivalry strikes me as it, it's just probably not gonna happen. But I think if you take scale seriously and you wanna think about how you restructure the global economy through law, you have to think about something like allocation of production shares. Because at this point, any, the, the economy of any advanced industrial country can supply all of the market. So what do you do if you want? And if that's tied to valuable domestic desiderata like employment and growth, you, then you have, to, you have to think about that as a, as a distribution question. As for the second point about, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll stop there. How about that? OK, anybody else? Quick, very briefly. Sorry, I, 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 I think the question is coming from the right place, but leading to the wrong conclusion. I don't think there can be one guiding vision for many of the reasons that David suggested. And so part of what we have to try to imagine is, uh, is how do we enable the emergence of a range of different kinds of visions, whether uh, to uh, and strategies um, to come forth and I mean, obviously we can have our own normative or ideological or social justice agendas that we're trying to form then. And, and then you could, but, but I think the idea that this is gonna be centralized through uh, national uh, agreement or, uh, or agreement of firms isn't really taking account of the current competitive structure of the global economy. So then we have to imagine New social movements have to emerge. New new exigencies might occur that provide opportunities. The pandemic might provide some opportunities for for uh, for rethinking the way in which we've relied so much on the global economy and focused so much on production to the to the detriment of distribution. 
So I guess I, I just want to weigh in. I, I can't just be a moderator. It's just humanly impossible. So I think that David said something extremely important in terms of what is going on right now with the Biden administration, with the debate over China and trade policy in China, because, because the fight is very much over the industries that have tremendous future and present scale possibilities. And that's what China 2025 was all about, China's effort to build to to basically be the leader in about I think there are about ten major industries, all of which have tremendous scale possibilities, and what the Trump administration was trying to do was stall that and slow it down and and impede it. Uh, what's going to happen now? Are we going to move away from that, or are we going to double down on that effort to stop China's effort? to control those industries. I leave it to you to guess on that. Anyone else on this question or should we go to one more? Okay. So let me just say something uh, on, on this question. I, I don't see such a cleavage in the Biden administration, but maybe maybe there is a cleavage or a debate, but, but it might not be necessarily on within the trade, uh, uh, field, but between trade and you know other uh, areas that are also about trade and finance, or you know other international economic law uh, oriented fields, I, I actually see that there's going to be in some ways continuity and doubling down. And if, if you think about the nominee for USTR, Catherine Tai, I think she has a very clear agenda that was, I think. Uh, really putting forth a, 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 in some ways, a continuation in the things that they agree with the, what the Trump administration was doing, but also a reorienting trade uh, as, as the Biden platform has announced to focus on jobs in the United States in creating, you know, more reshoring production in really thinking about distributional consequences uh, here. And so in that regard, I think that you know, that was visible in some elements of the Democratic Party, even before Trump, right? The, the opposition to TPP, the very much, I think, also informed by the discontent with the internet, with the investor state dispute settlement system. So in some ways, I think there's going to be a different way of, of carrying out trade policy, but I don't see a return to the, say, Obama or even Clinton, uh, uh, policy at all. And, and in that regard, I think that there's not going to be just like Dan was saying, like a sort of global vision, but like, uh, you know, very forceful new agendas and then opportunities as things reshuffled, uh, you know, uh, for other countries to uh, new alignments. Uh, I, I really don't see sort of a multilateral coherent global vision. So any other comments on that issue? Sonia? No. Okay. So here's a question for Alvaro. There seems to be a significant variation in the levels of disruption among Latin American countries. What would be some of the factors to explain this variation? Well, some of it depends on uh, the international agreements that the part that the states have uh, signed, and so there, the clear example is the outlier, which is Brazil, uh, which never really uh, embraced ISDS, and so it has a different model, and therefore. Uh, it hasn't been subject to the claims that other countries have been. And so that's a really interesting model, even part of what I was calling reconceptualizing international investment uh, agreements. Uh, and then I think the rest depends on the, the market size of the countries and the exposure they've had to to investors, given the sectors that uh, are 
important in those countries, uh, very prominent, uh, you know, sort of uh, natural resources and, and uh, energy resources in the case of Bolivia, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, or in the case of Mexico, a combination of both that and also uh, other sectors like manufacturing, where uh, they've received a number of important number of claims, but that has to do with the web of treaties that these states have signed, and perhaps also with how they were, um, how careful they were in their regulatory uh, policies. But, but I think that that at least helps explain uh, what the variation of the disruption is in terms of how the countries have been affected. Uh, can I? Let me just add one thing and then you can go on, but I, I just want to support that. And of course, the thing important the thing to understand is with the, why did Brazil such an outlier? Because it's by far the largest economy. It was the large, most fast growing economy. It attracted a huge amount of foreign investment. Uh, the scale of the, there's a scale issue right there, the scale of the economy. So Brazil could, could didn't need to have these agreements to attract investment because it was such an attractive source of investment because of the rapid growth and the scale of, of, of the economy. So that is, I think, a major factor in explaining. Uh, obviously, there are multiple factors, but uh, the, the size of the economy uh, is, is clearly an important thing in explaining the differences in how these countries felt they needed to deal with this regime. I'm sorry, Albert, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, respond. I see the question by Eliana Porres, which, Porras, which is related. Uh, so if I may, just very briefly, Eliana, as always, I think is right on, on point. And she's saying that I seem to be much more hopeful on the reconceptualization agenda rather than the redomestication because of the distributional politics, uh, the open-ended distribution of politics of, of redomestication. And she notes that reconceptualization can also be fairly thin in design and hard to implement. And so I think that she's right. Uh, I, I don't have a strong preference for either of these two. I, uh, at this point, it's more sort of a map and, and kind of identifying the options. I, I think there are some benefits, clear benefits to the, to the reconceptualization uh, agenda. But it's true that it could often be left with a more lip service than effective remedies, and that it will also depend on what's your bargaining power when you're negotiating. So, you know, nothing guarantees that it actually will work out well and that uh, you will in fact be able to empower the local communities uh, and make sure that investments that are coming to your country are screened and that they will have the development objectives that you want and so forth. So I think that, that that's worth noting. Okay, I think we sort of bring this to a close. So I'm gonna give everybody an opportunity for one minute final uh, comments if you want it and not necessarily if you don't. And we'll go again in reverse order with David and then Dan and then uh, Sonia and then Alvaro. One minute. Very briefly, in, in thinking about this question of like how, how you would do deal with scale at the global level. I didn't mean to seem sanguine about the possibility of new multilateral agreements. I don't think that they will be forthcoming quickly, but rather that to the extent that scale does present efficiencies and that there are many kinds of industries that small countries probably can't share, some kind of form of cooperation across borders is, is, is gonna be a de facto or de jure part of even a world in which significant powers are reshoring many things. You know, the US can reshore everything, but many countries can't. So working out those linkages is important. And I, it seems to me that as trade scholars, bringing democracy back solidly and, and squarely at the center of what we do is important. Back to the NIEO conversation, I think where, where it fell down was it didn't have that political value at the heart of the agenda. Instead, it imagined that levels of economic development would naturally bring solidarity. That proved to be not the case. Whereas I wonder about the new idea to develop, as it were, a cons uh, an alliance of democracies. Maybe that normative vision will prove more durable. Thank you. And yeah, 
I guess one thing that struck me just in thinking about the whole thing, the, the discussion as a whole was um, was one thing I think we should put on the agenda is sort of the, the experimentation, a lot of the um, a lot of the resistances and innovations that were being described at the national level um, were were uh, were basically being they were involving relative, relatively powerful, relatively big market, relatively important players of, in the global economy. And I'm just wondering how, so what's, what possibilities are there and what kinds of things might we offer to the countries that aren't going to be able to um, be world competitive in anything that are actually uh, don't have a market size that's significant or a huge amount of foreign investment. And how do we bring those people? And if, and if the idea is the neoliberal promise was we're gonna bring you all in, well, that didn't work. So now the question is how do we, how do we support those countries in developing alternatives? And what, might, what those alternatives might be. Maybe that's aggregating amongst themselves. Maybe that's, there, there are lots of possibilities, but I feel like that piece needs to be on the table because, you, you know, I'm not so worried about China or Brazil continuing to manage to some, be successful. I'm much more worried about a lot of other countries that just don't have that clout and don't have the kinds of autonomy or um, bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis capital markets firms to uh, to play those roles uh, as, as iconoclastic as um, as Brazil and China and others have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff, you want to answer that? So, uh, Alvaro. Oh, Sonia, oh. wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. Alvaro, go ahead, then we'll go to Sonia. Sonia, have the last word. All right. So I think that. Uh, Neoliberalism was very successful in uh, depoliticizing crucial questions of distribution. And uh, it seems to me that this is an opportunity as the system is crumbling down to actually bring those questions back and, and to reclaim politics and, and deliberation as, as a mode of engagement that had been basically look down on. And I think that, you know, the discipline of economics and, and law, particularly international economic law, also bear responsibility for this, uh, you know, the way we teach and, and write about many of these issues. I think that uh, it's important to start by democratizing, you know, the profession and, and the scholarship by bringing, making open or opening up these questions. There'll be, a lot of questions that are hard and that involve trade-offs you know, about uh, workers in the rich countries and workers in the in the developing countries that often there can't be i mean there are often trade-offs and and there can't be win-win solutions sometimes there can but but not always the same is true with questions of um you know, workers uh, versus sustainability and industries that, you know, we want to face that, to face uh, whatever out because we want to include clean energies or invest in that Well, there'll be pain and dislocation too. And I, I think these are just two examples, but, but it's important to actually make those questions more central and think about how we can deliver it and debate them and, and, and see how we decide those questions, both in the rich and, 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 and developing countries, but also when we're trying to uh, do global partnerships or alliances. And, and it seems to me that, you know, we need to reclaim the work of politics in that regard. And this is, this is an important opportunity. Okay, Sonia, you get the last word. It's an honor. Um, well, I want to pick up on the, what Dan was uh, just saying in his concluding remarks, um, because I have similar concerns. The, the, the system that we have is really designed to balance out two poles, protectionism and free trade. 
right? And it operates on that spectrum. But now we're in a different place. China is a power trader. For China, international commerce is a tool for geopolitical and just political might for creating new kind of dependent relationships, etc. The, the, the US is getting pulled in that direction as well. Um, seeking an answer to power trading in the traditional framework will never work because the traditional framework is just not designed to deal with power trading. It's designed to deal with protectionism and, uh, and free trade on the other hand. Um, but all of this really leaves, it risks leaving in the lurch the small players, as Dan was saying, um, that, that are only ever going to be instruments and, and uh, recipients of the rules, whoever gets to make the rules and, and pawns in the power playing game. And so that, that's definitely a real concern, one, one that I share. Okay, thank you all. I think this was very, very successful. It, it achieved what those of us who started this project uh, had hoped for, which was to open up the debate, look forward, not backward, identify the issues. Uh, uh, we haven't yet quite worked out all the uh, precise solutions or ready to draft the new treaties, but at least we've made a start. So, um, uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the LPE project for making this happen. You've become a very, very important part of, uh, of, of the, the current debate in the United States and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and around the world. And uh, it's been an honor for me to uh, help with, with this initiative. So uh, tune in. Uh, there are lots more of these uh, a webinar is a, a very, very fascinating topics. Everything is well described on the uh, LPE website. And uh, I hope to see you, uh, uh, you, that is all of you in the audience and all of you on the panel in some future uh, webinar on some other topic or another one of these. So um, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, as I say in Brazil, until another day. Até qualquer dia. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. Okay.